The technical intricacies of the vehicles that we're working on today is nothing short of amazing. When you consider that the OEMs are producing more power out of smaller displacements than ever before. Advances in safety assist systems has already had a major positive impact on our nation's highways and we're on the edge of an all-electric autonomous future. And the way we service and repair these systems has changed just as dramatically. The ways that we learned even a few short years ago are no longer applicable, especially when it comes to the dozens of electronic systems on a modern vehicle. To put it quite simply, today you're either fixing it right or you're fixing it wrong. No gray area in between anymore. Hi, I'm Pete Meyer and I'll explain what I mean in today's Cardone ProTech. The Cardone ProTech series is produced in partnership with MotorAge, America's oldest trade publication for the automotive professional. Technicians today, both professional and DIYer, often don't understand the advances in technology showcased by the vehicles sitting in their service bays or driveway. And the service and repair techniques we use on these vehicles has advanced as well. Minor mistakes or oversights can easily and drastically affect how a system performs and may even lead to damage to vehicle components. When it comes to replacing most electrical components, whether they be electronic throttle bodies, oxygen sensors, fuel injectors, control modules, or even batteries, additional steps after the components are installed to ensure they function correctly and without issue are often required. Of all the electronic components that you'll likely have to change, the most expensive is arguably one of the many electronic control units on the vehicle, like this engine control module. Typically, there are three ways the manufacturer may offer an engine control module for sale. Increasingly common is the sale of virgin modules, meaning there is no operational software installed on the module. And until the programming is completed, it's nothing more than an expensive doorstop. Other modules are sold pre-programmed, meaning that they have the required software installed for the application. However, that doesn't mean that some additional steps may need to be taken before the module can function properly on the specific vehicle it's being installed in. And yet others are sold with generic programming, which means that the operational software installed in the module may or may not work with the application that you're installing it in and there certainly could be issues with the function of the vehicle and there may be additional steps necessary in order to make the module work correctly. And in order to understand more fully, let's talk about what programming really is. Programming, often also referred to as reprogramming, flashing, reflashing, or software updates, is the process of installing the software into the control module. It's the software that's been written by the engineers that tells the module how to do its job. Today, we have the capability to reprogram or update the software in the modules, which allows the manufacturer to continuously improve the product. Now, you may have heard me refer to that before, saying a module needs to be reflashed or reprogrammed. And that information is generally made available through what's called a technical service bulletin issued by the OEM. Think of it this way. We all own one of these, don't we? By itself, it can't do much of anything. So it has to have software installed in order for the phone to work and carry out all the other functions this neat little piece of engineering is capable of performing. And don't you get periodic updates for your phone? Sure you do, to address bugs in the system or provide other fixes to make the product even better. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes there are additional steps that need to be done after the module's programmed. It's called coding or configuration. 
Coding and programming are often confused with one another. Coding is the process of loading information into the module, giving the module specific information about the vehicle it's being installed in. Using our cell phone example, think of coding as marrying your phone to your network that you use for your service, AT&T, Verizon, whomever. A module that is not coded or coded improperly may have some functions that don't work the way they should, if at all. Coding also tends to be less invasive than programming. If a mistake occurs during the programming phase of the module, you can actually turn the module into nothing more than another expensive doorstop, making it useless and requiring its total replacement. Some coding processes require access to OEM files via the OEM service information sites, while others can be done with a capable aftermarket scan tool. Just be advised that not all aftermarket scan tools are created equally. And last, but at no means least, is the process of calibration, also known as learn, relearn, or initialization. Typically, calibrations do not require the use of OEM factory tooling or service information sites, and most aftermarket scan tools are capable of carrying out these tasks. It's also interesting to note that the need for calibration has grown quite a bit over the last several years. Here's a few examples for you. You may not be at all surprised to learn that when you replace the crankshaft position sensor on many vehicles, you need to perform a calibration of that sensor to the engine control module. But you might be surprised to learn that you have to do the same thing even after just fixing a misfire complaint no matter what the cause of the misfire might have been. Another common example is doing an oxygen sensor heater circuit calibration when replacing an oxygen sensor. Failure to do so could impact not only the operation of the sensor, but cause the new sensor to fail soon after installation because now the ECM is supplying too little or too much current to the heater circuit. And as I mentioned, these are just a few of the many examples that I could give you. For the do-it-yourselfer attempting to do a lot of these repairs in your driveway on a Saturday afternoon, it's not as easy as it once was. You might want to avail yourself of any of the professional level service information sources. I have a link in the video to a few of them and read up on the procedures that you'll need to follow when attempting a new repair. And keep in mind that if you don't calibrate some of these components, it's not the component's fault when it doesn't work. Simply taking it back and exchanging it for another one isn't going to solve the problem. After all, let's be honest with each other, you don't know what you don't know. And for the professional, when it comes to programming or coding a module, that requires first and foremost training on how to do the job properly. It also requires access to a professional level service information site and often to the factory service information site for the vehicle that you're trying to program. It's also going to require specialized tooling like a J2534 pass-through device, a competent battery maintainer, and often factory level scan tools. And remember this, whether you're a professional or a do-it-yourselfer, take the time to do your homework before you attempt to make the repair or perform the service. Like I said at the very beginning, today folks, you either fixed it right or you fixed it wrong. Thanks for watching.